It's a fairly small island, but the Japs have it well defended. We know from reconnaissance photography just about where they are, and it's your job to blast those defenses before the Marines go in. We'll come in this way, from southeast. Come up here, fella. Landmarks you can follow. This river with its flat grassland has nothing you have to worry about. Up here in the hills on both sides are well prepared defenses, mortar and machine gun emplacements, and barracks. These are your targets as well as this airstrip. Don't waste anything on this river area. There's nothing there we can see. Go to it and good luck. boys did a thorough job of blasting those defenses. They caught the Japs flat-footed and got all the targets. They stuck to the hills and the airstrip and brought back pictures to show the result. The planes cleared most of the prepared defenses and the fleet's pounding it now. We go in in the morning. Here's the layout. Our only landing point is this flat strip right here at this stream. Now the place will be mined, so we'll head for the tall grass back here. That will give the men cover right up to the jungle. There's nothing to worry about down here at the stream. And that's a break for the men, too. Stay in there behind the fleet's garage before you move up. Look these over. We rendezvous at 0520 and go in at 0530. Good luck. That grass was a break. We got to the beach all right and headed for the tall grass. We went through it slowly. We waited there until everything was set for us. And then we went in and got the jab. They put up a tough fight as usual. But outside of a few hiding out in the caves and trees, we got most of them in a couple days. Casualties were light. The medical staff didn't have much to do and cleared their beds in a few days. We were sitting pretty. Strong points had been bypassed, a forward base had been established, and Tokyo looked closer than ever. Best of all, it hadn't cost much. 5,500 of us went in and all but a few were getting set to move again. Then it began. It started slowly, about 10 days after we came ashore. First, seven men were brought in sick from the jungle. They didn't feel good. Headache and fever, mostly. A few hours later, more patients. Then it grew like an avalanche. More cases, more every hour, until within a few days there were hundreds. At 
first, it looked like malaria, but the blood smears were negative. Every patient was thoroughly checked, and they found these. Escars, little black escars surrounded by an area of reddened skin. This one was pretty big. They usually are much smaller. Buboes are often found in the areas draining them. These escars were the tip-off. Then about the fifth day, they found the spotty rash. Doctors called it a maculopapular rash. It never becomes hemorrhagic and fades within a week or less. You learn a lot of medicine lying in a hospital cot. This was scrub typhus. It has a lot of other names, but they all mean the same disease. Mite typhus. Japanese river fever. Flood fever. Coastal scrub typhus. Kedani fever. Sutsugumushi. And in Japanese, that means dangerous bug. And that's exactly what it is. Headache and prostration are intense. Patients don't rest well. They cough a lot and have bad dreams. In the early stage, the pulse is low while the temperature remains up around 103 to 104. As the disease progresses, the patient gets sicker. In the second week, things become critical. There is pulmonary congestion, cyanosis. The heart begins to fail. The pulse gets more rapid. Edema becomes prominent. Temporary auditory nerve may be common. Blood tests prove the diagnosis from the 8th to the 16th day. The wild Felix using Proteus OXK gives a definite positive, as does the complement fixation test. But the patient gets worse. He still has trouble resting. The dreams become worse. And in severe cases like this, merge into delirium and coma. There are no vaccines, drugs, or sera for this disease. Treatment is primarily supportive. Good nursing is most essential to recovery. Fowler's position eases respiration. Oxygen decreases the burden on the heart and likewise eases respiration. Its use lowers the mortality. Maintenance of fluid and salt balance is important. Diet should be a high caloric, soft diet with frequent feedings. Absolute rest should be ensured with barbiturates or opiates if necessary. And most of the cases pull through it all right. Between the 16th and the 21st day, the temperature drops to normal over a three to four day period. Drenching sweats accompany it. The heart becomes stronger. Respiration improves and the pulse rate falls. The edema subsides, leaving the patient wasted. Convalescence is slow and takes from one to three months rehabilitation and gradual exercise. There is little, if any, permanent damage to the heart, lungs, or brain. And after convalescence, the men are ready for full duty. But we had 1,200 cases on our island, and 138 of those men died. That's pretty bad but it's only part of the story. One quarter of us on our backs, 
another quarter required to take care of it. Half of us immobilized and the rest worried for fear we'd be the next. We'd hit a pretty tough spot. Some places have a lower mortality rate, down to about five out of a hundred cases. In others, there may be 10, 15, or 20 out of every hundred cases. This may be explained by different strains of organisms in different areas. The Japs have it too, and bad. In Japan, the mortality may run as high as 40%. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going. It's another one of these small islands that the Japs have been quietly fortifying for the past 20 years. We have plenty of aerial reconnaissance photographs that show where the hot spots are. Here's a scale model of the whole works. You better look them over pretty carefully. You'll find plenty of things there to talk about when we get together later. Colonel, there's something I'd like to talk about now. Let's have it, Doctor. These pictures warn me about something you fellows may not know. There's more on this island than jets. There's something your men won't see unless they know how to look for it. And that something can be awfully bad. What's that? Well, what is it? It's scrub typhus, Tsuchigomushi disease. And you've seen the reports on that. Well, how do you know it's scrub typhus? Our uh, aerial cameras can't photograph bugs. This kind of topography is always suspicious. When you have flat marshy land along a stream merging into jungle like this, it tells us to look closer. And this picture clinches it. This tall swamp grass growing in that area is either kunai or kadani grass. You can bet your last dollar that when you have this grass out here in this specific area, you'll find mites. And mites carry sutsukumushi. That doesn't mean that you'll only find mites in kunai grass. In other Pacific areas, they may be found even on cleared ground. But on this island, kunai grass means mites. Now, this may bore you, but I'd rather tip you off now and save a lot of hell later. No, keep right, right on. on. Go ahead. I'll have to give you the whole works. And on this island, it starts right here. In the grassy margins of jungle streams, in the shaded junction of grass and jungle area, but mostly in kunai grass fields and swamps. Wherever you find this type of growth, you'll find rats or other rodents and mites. M-I-T-E-S, mites. In some areas, the ground is full of them. They're tiny red things that are about the size of a pinpoint. Magnified, an adult mite looks like this. It's an eight-legged speck that can carry a terrific wallop. Different species are found in various parts of the world. And this type can carry the rickettsii that cause tsutsu gamushi. Let's see where the rickettsii come in. This adult female is laying its egg. It usually lays one at a time. We'll follow its life cycle. This is the larval mite, the chigger. It only has six legs and lives in the marshy ground or the vegetation there. It has one major desire at this stage, a blood meal. The chigger can't develop without blood and goes after it. Here the chigger is on a rat. It's not particular where the blood comes from. The proboscis goes in, usually at a hair follicle, injects salivary fluid, and draws out blood. This chigger got more than it bargained for. The rat was infected with the rickettsii of Tsutsugamushi. They go in with the blood and thrive there, but have no effect on their host. Having had its blood meal, the chigger drops off, goes underground, and becomes quiescent. 
It then goes through the nympho chrysalis stage. Two more legs develop. It emerges as a nymph and from now on becomes a vegetarian. The nymph stays underground and grows into the adult mite. The adult mite is harmless to man because like the nymph, it is a vegetarian. But this one still carries in its body the organism that causes Tsutsugamushi. It passes the rickettsii to its offspring in the egg. The chigger which emerges is now all set to look for blood, animal or human, and finds it. The proboscis goes in, salivary fluid is injected, but now rickettsii go in with it. The chigger has had his blood meal, and a new victim has been inoculated. The chigger remains infectious and passes the rickettsii on through its life cycle. Each succeeding generation produces an ever-increasing number of rickettsii-bearing larval mites, each one looking for a single blood meal and a single victim. Multiply this by countless millions and you find areas which are dangerous reservoirs of infection. The rats, other rodents and birds inhabiting these characteristic growths keep the mites alive and infectious. Anything that looks like this, especially in designated Pacific areas, will have potential dynamite waiting for our men when they come in. Jungle war, you can't very well keep fighting men out of those areas. And the mites are so small, you can't be on the lookout for them. But we have a solution. We keep the mites away from the men? Exactly. They have insect repellents, which do more than keep them away. They kill the mites. All the clothing and blankets are impregnated with dimethyl phthalate or other repellent before the men go into those areas, and most of the danger is eliminated. I have all the material and detailed instructions for clothing impregnation. Will you prepare the necessary orders for my signature? Will you get that done immediately? We get together again at 1400. There's plenty of work ahead of us. The orders came through and things began to happen. To make certain it was done right and no one was left out, we mustered by companies and had the whole thing explained to us. Then we were told to break out our clothes and blankets. They really meant everything. Everything that we'd wear or use in a landing. Pants, shirts, blankets, socks. Socks are most important because those chiggers usually hit the feet first. In the meantime, the corpsman had been preparing the impregnating solution. To be most effective, it has to be done right. Under the supervision of a medical officer, they carefully check the instructions. These were printed in detail and told how to mix the soap and the repellent. Mixing is very important at the start, and even while dipping. All clothing is checked before dipping. It must be dry to assure adequate treatment and to keep from diluting the solution. Socks are put into pants pockets. Shorts are the only things left out. Dimethyl phthalate irritates the scrotum slightly. So all men wearing impregnated clothing should wear untreated shorts. The dipping doesn't take long, but every part of each garment and each blanket is completely immersed.
Then they're hung up to dry. Every garment is marked to show that it's been dipped. That makes it easy to see that every man is set for the chiggers as well as the Japs. Corman makes sure every uniform has been treated when the clothes are returned in a check muster. In a few days, we were ready to move, every man protected. The repellent treatment lasts for 30 days under normal conditions. It remains effective even after 15 minutes waiting in fresh water or 30 minutes in the ocean. The corpsman carried plenty of prepared emulsion along for redipping whenever necessary. We didn't know where we were going. Scuttlebutt named every island in the Pacific, even Japan. When we heard the guns of the fleet, we knew we were pretty close. We got ashore and made for cover in the tall grass. This time we were a little worried about what was in there with us. For added protection, we applied the repellent to exposed areas, neck and hand. We each had a supply along. We were pretty busy and didn't have much time to think about it, but hoped the stuff would work. It wasn't long before we established a firm beachhead pushed the Japs back to the other side of the island. At night, we just flopped wherever we could find a safe spot. The treated blankets took care of the enemies we couldn't see. When we set up camp after the Japs were eliminated, the commanding officer and the medical men checked the camp site. They weren't taking any chances. Bulldozers then went to work. These babies are really medical instruments. They prevent disease by clearing away any vegetation which can harbor mites. They strip everything off the surface and leave clean ground. and grass is burned to leave no breeding places for rats and chiggers. Cleared areas are sprinkled with powdered sulfur to kill any stray mites which have escaped the scraping. Living quarters are decked to keep anything in the ground where it belongs. They really checked that camp. Nothing was left exposed where rats could get at it. We weren't laying out the welcome mat. No, the reception we prepared took care of them and any stowaways they carried aboard. The men weren't allowed to take any chances. showed results. There were men in the hospital, but they were mostly caused by the Japs. We had a few cases. Tsutsugamushi will always get the men who are a little careless. But most of us never forgot that even though the Japs were gone, we didn't have the island to ourselves. They didn't give us much chance to forget. They reminded us every time our clothes needed redipping. 
it was a good camp because of all of this. The extra precautions didn't interfere with our activities, but there were many of us who didn't need to be reminded. We had other memories. We remembered another landing and the hell that broke loose after it. We remembered the hundreds who would rather have had a Jap bullet wound than what they did have. We learned the hard way, by burning up with fever, by coughing, by restless dreams and delirium, by not caring whether we pulled through it or not, and wondering whether everything the doctor did wasn't wasted. And then we remembered the long pull back to normal. The endless days and nights of just cussing our luck. We'd gone in to get Japs, but a little red chigger got us first. Well, things are different now. Anything that can lick that chigger gets our support. Sure. We'll cooperate to get our full share of protection. The well-policed camp, the absence of rats, and the impregnation symbol mean a lot to us. Sutsugamushi means dangerous bug. The Japs are right about that. It is dangerous. Someday we'll lick it. But right now, we'll shy clear of it. At least I will. I've had it.